I had, over several weeks, prepared quite a theological message on the subject for today. And over the last two days, I felt like God kind of checked me. And um, one of the things that I really felt like God was directing me to, if you open up your, your bulletin inside, there is a glossary. And I'm going to give this to you because I'll go grab my own. <laughs> Am I still on the camera? <laughs> now, um, in your bulletin, there's a thing, it's called the Common Man's Guide to Christian Ease. Or you can, you can actually say, Glenn's Glossary. Because these, these are not like dictionary definitions. These are me attempting to explain to you what I mean when I use these words. Okay? So when Glenn says, atonement, you, you know Christians, we have our own language, right? We have this kind of obscure thing where we throw words out there that make us sound different than the world, and we walk home having no clue what we just talked about. You know, um, one of the big things uh, growing up was, oh, I'm sanctified! And I would go, you know, and, and people would come up to me and go, how are you doing today? I'm sanctified! <laughs> Man, I thought that was some kind of coffee. <laughs> a sanctified? You drank Sanka this morning? What is that? And so what I've done is I've, I sat down and I, I came up with a list of words. And you, you notice sanctified is on here. Okay. And I'm, I'm just putting a simple explanation as to what they are. And I just want to kind of run through this. So when you guys hear me talk about one of these words, when I say sanctified, or when I say holy, or when I say um, vicarious, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So, atonement. What does atonement mean? Reconciliation. Oh, boy, great. He used a big word to explain a big word. We're going to, we'll talk about reconciliation in a moment. Uh, satisfaction. Healing of the relationship between man and God. God is satisfied now with our relationship. So when you hear me talk about atonement, I'm talking about what was done so that now God is satisfied with us. Okay? Confession. We, we talk about confession all the time. You know, confession isn't talking. Although that's part of it. Confession is simply to agree with God to acknowledge what he has said is so. And, and confession doesn't always have to be unto sin. You know, we don't just confess our sins, we also confess our faith. Okay? So when, when you hear, oh, you need to confess! Really what you need to do is agree with God that what God says is so is really so. Okay? And if that means that you're stuck in an area and God is telling you, yeah, that's sin, you need to get rid of that, you need to go, you're right. God, this is sin. I need to quit doing that. And so that's confession. And when you are confessing your faith, your belief in God and what he has said is so, that is confession. We're just agreeing with God. Okay? Grace. We, we talk about grace all the time. What is grace? Okay? Well, great. Unmerited favor. Okay? That means you didn't deserve it. Okay, so grace, simply put, is you got something you did not deserve. And we have to understand this, okay? Because it's on this that salvation rests, okay? We need to understand, and we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to be using a lot of these terms in the message today. That's why I wanted to put these out for you, okay? When I'm talking about grace, we need to understand we did not do, we could not do anything to deserve this. Okay, that's what makes it grace. That's what makes it so marvelous. Is that it, it wasn't dependent on our ability to do anything. Holy. Well, there's a term we hear in church all the time. Holy. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the term holy, I think robes and censors. 
you know, the thing they put the incense in and the, and the ball and then they... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think of when I hear holy. All right? You got your own ideas. I'll laugh at those later. <laughs> okay? But well, what does holy mean? Okay? Simply put, it means separate. It means it is not common. Okay? Um, unique, without sin or blemish. And we'll, we'll talk about sin in a moment as well. Okay? So when we talk about a holy God, okay, we're talking about a God that is completely separate from everything we know. He is completely unique. And he has called us to be holy. He says, be holy, as my Father in heaven is holy. <laughs> to be without sin? We're going to talk about that today as well. Incarnation. That's one of those Catholic words. Simply put, this is also unique. There's only ever been one incarnation. There will only ever be one incarnation. The God-man. 100% God, 100% man. Do it with me now. <laughs> fully God and fully man. All right, so you guys are never going to forget that. That's the incarnation. Fully God, fully man. Something unique, something done by the power and authority of God. Okay? Justification. Justification. To prove to be right or just. Well, that's, you're not supposed to use the word in the definition. Forgive me, I'm not Miriam Webster. Okay? When you are justified, you are proven to be right. Okay? And we're going to see how all of these words play off of each other, all of these ideas and concepts. And I know, Matthew, you spoke last week about how we tend to get caught up in these words. I'm not trying to undo what Matthew said, because Matthew really hit it on the head last week when he spoke, and I thought he did an incredible job. Mm -hmm. Grace. It's, it's all dependent on grace, and that's really where our focus needs to be. But you're going to hear me using these terms today because we're talking about the nature and condition of man. Okay? So, mercy. Now, mercy is kind of the other side of the coin from grace. Grace is giving you what you did not deserve. Mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. Okay? God in his mercy does not label you with the sin that you deserve to be labeled with, assuming you are under his grace. Okay? So, grace is you got something you didn't deserve. Mercy is you didn't get what you did deserve. They go together. Okay? If you have grace, you have mercy. If you have mercy, you have grace. Propitiation. There's a word. <laughs> Propitiation. To regain the favor of. Okay? To regain the favor of. Reconciliation. To change or exchange as in the nature or relationship between God and man. Okay? So what we are doing when we talk about reconciliation, we are changing the nature of the relationship between us and God. We are being reconciled to Him. And that goes back to the, the message that we had a couple weeks ago where we talked about the nature of man, the condition, the problem is that we are an affront to God by our very nature from Adam on down. And yet God has made a way for us to be reconciled to Him. Okay? So the nature of our relationship is changed. Redeemed. Oh, yeah, quick on the spot. Go to YouTube. Christy, help him with that. We're going we're gonna to talk about this in a little bit. It's the um... Redeemed. Now, I love this term because it really carries the idea of where we are and what we were. Okay? To buy back, to relieve from distress, to free from captivity. What this literally means, scripturally, 
When we see re redeemed in the Bible, the, the word that we translate as redeemed was a slave term. Okay? It was a slave term. And it was, you went and purchased a slave out of slavery and set them free. Okay? We see this idea conveyed so very clearly in the book of Hosea. Okay? Remember his wife, Gomer, went off and, and she was owned by a pimp. She was prostituting herself. And God told Hosea, go and buy her out. Restore her. Redeem her. Because this is my image of what I'm going to do. Redeem her. So Hosea, who was offended because his wife had an affair on him, not just an affair, she went and prostituted herself. And Hosea went and redeemed her out of that and brought her back home. Okay? This is the nature of relationship that we have with God. We need to understand we're the prostitutes in this relationship. We're the ones that went out and had an adulterous affair with all the crap of this world. And God reached out and he paid the price to redeem us out of that slavery. Okay? So redeemed. Sanctified. <clears throat> Sanctified just means to be made holy. Well, here we go, using the word again. What does holy mean? To be made separate. To be made unique. Okay? So when we're talking about being sanctified, that's when God took us out of the common and put us in the unique. Okay? An example of this, an illustration of this, is in the Old Testament. We see the establishment of the tabernacle. Okay? Remember when they were making the tabernacle? There were instructions as to how to make all the articles that would be used in the tabernacle. The spoons, the knives, all the different things. They were made out of common stuff. Okay? Well, maybe not so common, but I mean it was gold and it was silver. And they went through the process that you would go through to make a spoon and a knife. But that wasn't sufficient for them to be used in the holy place of God. So God said there has to be a way to make them holy. And there was a process whereby they went, there was a sacrifice made for them, there was the shedding of blood, the blood was anointed onto them, and they became holy. Now when they became holy, they were dedicated unto God, they were for His purposes alone. Matter of fact, so much so, that when the Babylonians overthrew Jerusalem, and they cleaned out the temple and they took all the articles and they took them back to Babylon with them. You guys remember the story? King goes, oh, I know. I'm going to throw a party and I'm going to let it. Let's pull out the stuff from that temple and we'll use it. We'll use it. And they started singing, oh, praise to the God of gold and silver and wood. And God said, eh. Okay, these are mine. These were set aside for me. I will share my glory with no one. And a hand came down and wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, you parson. And that very night, the kingdom was stripped from Babylon. And was given to the Medes and the Persians. Okay. This is how God feels about us. Okay. He has taken us from the common and he has made us unique. And we are to be used for His purposes only. God will not share you with anything. You're His. Sin. Okay, now I put this very simple. A transgression against the law of God. Okay? You, you, you broke the law. You broke what God said should be. Now, look, we need to understand something. Okay? The law isn't something God did on a day when he didn't have a whole lot going on. So he thought, you know, I'm going to sit down and come up with a list of rules and regulations. We're kind of in the in-between season. Fruit looks like it's growing pretty good. Wheat's going okay. Eh, not a lot of wars going on. Got that handled. What should I do today? I know. I'll make the law. The law is an expression of who God is and how very different 
he is from us. Because see, the law is not something God needs to keep. It is who he is. That's the perfection that he is. So when we talk about the holiness of God, you know, we look at the Ten Commandments. And I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. The Ten Commandments, we couldn't even keep the Ten Commandments. There were only ten. Well, let's, let's reduce it even further. There was only one in the garden. Don't eat of this tree. Don't eat the banana. You, that's not what you thought I was going to say, huh? <laughs> we don't know what kind of fruit it was. <clears throat> don't eat that. And what did they do? One command! And they blew it. Okay? The, the sin is when we choose knowingly or unknowingly, to violate God's commands. Okay? To go in opposition to the nature of God. And I say willingly, knowingly, or unknowingly because we, we sin unknowingly all the time. That's part of how far we've fallen away from God. That, that's the scary thing about it, how far we've fallen away from God. I mean, I thank God every day for the sins that he has forgiven me for, the ones that I'm aware of. Boy, I blew that. Thank you, God, that I am forgiven for that. But man, how many things have I done that I'm not even aware offended him? That's the marvelous thing about grace, because those are covered too. Those are covered as well. Vicarious. Here's another big churchy word. Vicarious. This simply means you substituted something for something else. Okay? So when we say Jesus was a vicarious propitiation for our sin. <coughs> People get up and walk out. Man, I didn't go to church to hear Latin. I thought they got rid of that in the 70s. No, 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 no. What, what we're saying is, because we have to do things, you know, big in church. What we are saying is, Jesus was a substitutionary Sacrifice, a substitutionary propitiation. Remember what's propitiation? To regain the favor of. Jesus was in our place to regain the favor of God because of our transgressing against the nature of God. It's a lot easier to say he was a vicarious propitiation for our sin. Okay. So we have the glossary here. Everybody got the glossary? If, if I use a word in the message, because this isn't the message, this is, this is just like a bonus. Okay, refer back to this. All right, open with me to John 3. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, we started the first of a two-part message. And we... Uh, <coughs> are still working through the essentials of our faith. These are the things we have to agree on. We're actually coming, we're, we're getting very close to the end of this. Um, I, the way I've got it planned right now is this message and potentially one more. Kind of depends how it goes because that one more might be divided into two. Uh, the further I get into it, the bigger it gets. So. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked and we started on the nature and condition of man. And we talked about the original sin of Adam and that, how that is propagated all throughout uh, mankind. So we've talked about the sin nature, how our very lives are an offense before God from Adam on down. Uh, we talked about how we knowingly and unknowingly sin, how we willingly sin, how the world, apart from God, doesn't even understand what sin is, um, and, and how we were a part of that world. Okay? So we talked about the problem. The problem is there is a holy God that created us, and we violated his holiness and thereby removed ourselves <coughs> from fellowship with him. Okay, we, we've taken ourselves out of fellowship, out of intimacy with God. And we talk about, oh, yeah, but I mean, you look in the Old Testament. They prayed all the time. Yeah, but in the garden, they walked with him. They walked with him. Okay? He manifested himself in their presence, and they walked in the garden. Okay? I don't know about you, but I haven't walked in a garden with God. Okay? Where he manifested himself physically and walked with me. 
Now there are times where when I'm praying and I'm having my quiet time with God, I tell you what, if I open my eyes fast enough, I know I'll see him sitting next to me. I can feel him there. I can feel him sitting next to me enjoying the morning. Okay? But I, I've never seen him. Uh, he never came and walked in the cool of the evening with me in the garden. Okay? So the problem is there's a chasm that is open between God and us. Now, the chasm is there because God is perfect and pure and cannot allow sin into his presence, but we are the ones that caused the chasm to be there. Okay, so that's the problem. Today, we talk about the solution. Now, I just mentioned one of the words we talked about, redeemed. How many here are redeemed? Okay, that is absolutely lame and pathetic. Okay, seriously? When we start to understand what redeemed means, if this is your response when you tell somebody you're redeemed, I don't think you are. Because if that's all you can muster for what he's done, you don't understand what he's done. John 3, let's get into it. All right? Um, we're going to start in verse 16. Now we're going to come down a little bit, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, we got that. I mean, that's, that's pretty common, right? I mean, does anybody here not have that verse memorized? Memorize it. But don't stop there. Let, let's continue on, okay? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, that's, that follows right on the heels, okay? God's not sending his son in to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to point his finger down at us and say, oh, no, you're out. You're out. I'm here to cast judgment on you. That will come. Understand, that will come. There's going to come a day when Jesus will come in judgment. But that's not this incarnation. That's, that's not this. Okay? That the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Okay. So right here, we see the entire nature, the entire dynamic of the relationship between God and man. All right. And I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way back up. Okay. We see that the world is already condemned. Okay? See, this, this is why Paul tells the church, don't bother judging the world. It is already judged. Okay? You can add nothing to or take anything away from the perfect judgment God has already given to the world. So don't waste your time. Okay? Quit. Stop. You don't need to do any more. We so like to do things over and over and over again, don't we? We like to be redundant. We like to reiterate our redundancies. And then we repeat them. Because we just got to make sure everybody gets the point. Look, here, here it is. The world is judged and condemned. We can do nothing beyond that. So don't bother. Don't waste your time. Okay. So that goes back to the message we spoke a couple weeks ago. This is the problem. This is the dynamic between man and God. Right? Okay. We have to understand this. Because if you don't understand this, you won't understand the first part of the verse. Because without understanding that we are condemned, it makes no sense why there would be a need for salvation. If you don't understand that you were condemned, you won't understand the need for salvation. And if you don't understand the need for salvation, I question whether or not you're saved. 
That's how important this is. Okay? Because if you weren't condemned, there's nothing to be saved from. <coughs> there's nothing to be saved unto. If you were already okay with God, then the entire cross you've made a mockery of. And Hebrews talks about that. Okay? If there's no need for a sacrifice for sin because there's no sin, then Jesus died in vain. Thank you so much for putting God's Son on a cross when you didn't need it. So we have to understand the world is condemned because of their sin. Okay? We got that. Now we're moving forward because God didn't leave us there. Thank God he did not leave us there. Amen? 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 Because, see, even when sin came in, even when the original curse was laid out before man, God was already telling us the promise. God was already speaking forth his deliverance. He was already speaking forth his salvation. Go back, look in Genesis chapter 3, look at the curse that was laid down. What nestled in the curse is the first promise of a Savior. Okay? When God lays out the curse and he says, the, the snake will bite your heel and you will bruise his head, he's speaking to the seed of the woman. Okay, seed, singular. Okay? He's speaking forth the promise of the Messiah to come, Jesus Christ. All right? So, let's work back up into this a little bit. Okay? So, um, the world's condemned. But whoever believes in him is not condemned. So, what is belief? Well, you know, it's, it's faith. We have to have faith in God. We have to believe that what he said is so. Now, that, that starts off with the condemnation, but it also carries through, because see, we, we, we talked about... Um, you know, uh, now I lost my place. Let me go back to my glossary. Check out the glossary. Good thing I have this. Um, confession to acknowledge either sin or, or faith. Okay? So we have to believe not only the condition of our sin, we also have to believe the condition of the faith. Okay? Therein lies our salvation. Okay? So if God sent his son to die... And that was it. There'd be no more problems, right? But, but, but that wasn't it. Because he didn't just say, God sent his son, everything's okay. There'd be no need for revelation. Everything's done. But he, he didn't stop there. He, he carried on and he, said, he tells us. He says, okay, so whoever believes in him is not condemned. Okay, so the, the act is the cross. The shedding of his blood unto death. The proof that it was sufficient is the empty tomb. So, there's a responsibility given to us. Now, let's, let's flip over to Ephesians. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2. Because I want you to understand this. We have to really have a firm grasp on this. So, we're in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 8. Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, right here in just a couple of verses, we have an incredible revelation. Okay? There is so much packed into these couple of verses that we could spend years just dwelling on these. Because all of the rest of Scripture is nestled in here. Okay? So first, it says, For by grace, what is grace? You get something you didn't deserve. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve this. You have been saved through faith. Can somebody tell me what faith is? Yeah. yeah. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us what faith is. Believing in something you can't see. Being assured of something you hope for. 
okay? Trusting that something that is told to you is so, okay? And without that, you cannot please God. So without that, there is no salvation. Do you see that? Okay? So God has given us grace. Now the cool thing about this is God also gives us the faith. Because in and of ourselves, how do we believe something that, I mean, we're cynical. I mean, all of mankind could be born in Missouri. Show me. Show me, show me, show me. Show me. Okay? So, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Okay? See, people, we have to dwell here. Paul clarifies. It's nothing that you did. It's nothing you could do. It's nothing you can do. It's God's gift to you. It is nothing earned. If it were earned, it would be, this is God's wage. <coughs> Excuse me. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Look, you can't say, oh yeah, I fed three orphans this week, and God's letting me into heaven. What'd you do? I fed a stray dog. No one has room to boast here. Because it's not anything based on us. Arrogance, pride goes right out the window. I'll tell you what. When you start getting cocky about your faith, oh, I'm running too far out. I haven't sinned in 16.2 seconds. <laughs> Guess what? You just blew it. And when you start looking askance at other people, oh, that brother over there, I saw what he did. Look, it's not based on you. Your salvation is not based on you, it's based on him. Just as his is not based on him. Sorry, I'm using you as an example. All right. <laughs> it's based on God. Okay, so what, where would I have any room for pride in this? In my ability to do or accomplish anything? There is no room for pride. As in fact, all that that should do for us is make us humble. It should make us go, God, we are but unworthy servants. Unworthy servants. Do with us as you will. Because see, if you don't have that attitude, then you start to take offense at things. Then you start to judge God for what he allows to come into your life. <laughs> okay, God, when I signed up for this, you said everything was going to be good. Ah, uh, what happened with the bills? There's a shortfall here. God. Look at what my wife is doing. Get her. Get her. What, what, why did you give me these kids? Don't you see the Joneses' kids? Why couldn't I have their kids? Because if you'd had their kids, they would have been your kids and you'd have been in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're casting judgment on God. Really? As if we deserve better? I'm a king's kid. You were a sinner saved by grace. That's what you are. Okay? So let's look a little bit further. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, I love this. I love this. Absolutely love this. <laughs> For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Do you understand what that means? This is something that you can take pride in, not because of yourself, but because of him. Do you realize how much value God has just placed on you in that one statement? Can you think of anything that God made that he did not say was good? 
Go back and look at the original creation. Man, when he was done at the end of the day, he looked at him and went, yeah, this is good. Matter of fact, when he wrapped up all the creation and man was created and put on the earth, he didn't just go, he's good. He, he said, this is very good. Oh, yeah. Now, keep in mind, he's saying this is very good, understanding that his son was already consigned to the cross. And he's still saying, this is very good. Okay, so when he says to you, you are my workmanship. Wow, you know how much your value just skyrocketed in the entire universe and in eternity? Because the creator of all of it has made you. The master craftsman has made you, and he has ascribed to you value. We are his workmanship. Priceless. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. <gasps> works, 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 works. What are you talking about works? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I'm, we've talked about this before. I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Do you notice the order here that Paul lays out? Grace first. Grace is extended to all man. The entire world has been extended grace. Then faith. Faith. Okay? That's our part to believe in the grace. Okay? And that, those two together, grace plus faith equals, come on, say it out, be bold. Say it loud, because it's worth saying loud. Salvation. 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 Grace plus faith equals... Salvation. Oh, you guys are lame. All right. Grace given by God, faith also given by God, but directed through us, equals salvation. salvation. Thank you. Okay? So, there is salvation. Then, okay, we're the workmanship. Why are we the workmanship? Because we are a new creation. We're new. We're new. Well, if that doesn't get you excited, you don't understand how yucky you were before. Because if you think you were okay before, you don't understand what he's made you into now. A new creation. And then, in our order, following our order through, okay, grace, faith, salvation, recreation, a new creation, and then what? Works. works. Okay. Are the works unto salvation? No, because you already have salvation. Grace plus faith equals salvation. And so if you are a new creation, the entire direction and focus of your life is also new. See how that works? And the entire focus and direction of your life being new is for what? To do what God has created for you to do. That simple. Okay? Now, it's that simple in theory. Living it out, you know, it's a little bit tough. Okay? Because I see that all of this that we just read here, all the rest of this tells us how to do that what it looks like, what we should be about, what we should be doing. Talking about the Great Commission. That's, that's the works here. We go out and we speak forth the things that God has done for us. We tell them the good news. All too often, we start off because the good news, in order for it to be good, there has to be bad news. The bad news is they're lost. And was, why do we so often get stuck on that? Oh, yeah, you're a sinner. Go to hell. Bye. Enjoy your coffee. <coughs> so that's just what, what the condition already is. We need to be presenting to them the good news. Okay? That's the works. But, but the works don't end just there. The, the, the works start in the home. <laughs> here, I'm hitting you below the belt. Right here, right now. Okay? Because if you are Christ to the sinner on the street, but you are not Christ 
to your husband, your wife, or your children, you're blowing it. Now I say this as self-condemnation to myself because the person that I tend to be Christ the least to is my wife. Okay? So don't, don't feel like I'm standing up here in judgment of you. I'm standing up here in judgment of myself because the one that I blow up with the most often and to the umpteenth degree is Christy. And so the good works that he has prepared for me to do, I'm still learning it. I'm still working through it. I'm still applying it. Um, getting better. Sometimes. <laughs> Wait, somebody say ask Christy. <laughs> getting better. Getting better. Not perfect. Remember what we say? Not perfectly, increasingly. Okay? So the good works. Okay, now we're going to jump ahead. Once more. We're going to jump up to uh, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. start in verse 17. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now it starts off, therefore. So when a verse starts off, therefore, it's incumbent on you, since I'm starting here, to go back and understand what the therefore is there for. Okay, so you have homework. You've got to check out and find out why this is here. Okay? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how do you get in Christ? Faith plus grace equals salvation. Okay? You are a new creation in Christ. Okay? So, if anyone is in Christ, he is a... Oh, looky there. What do we find? A new creation. Wow. That's awesome. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Boy, we could spend a lot of time right there, couldn't we? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Okay, reconciled, what does that mean? Yeah, he, he's exchanged the relationship from being separated from him to having relationship with him. Okay, and do, do you notice the direction of this? He's reconciled us to himself. That's important that we understand that because he's the offended party. Okay? He's the offended party. So we violated his command. What is that called? Sin. Sin. So we violated his command. So we've offended him. And yet he has made a way for us to be reconciled. But it doesn't stop there. Christ, uh, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh-oh. Okay, so first we're reconciled. See, it's following the same pattern that we just read. First we have been reconciled, and then the good works created for us to do, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. <coughs> you understand what that means? Do you understand what that means? Because this is important, people. You have been called and made an ambassador from God to the world. You have been given a message to carry to the world. Okay? Now, for some of us... Um, TJ, for example, the kidders that were here a couple weeks ago, um, Kevin and Imelda, going to the world literally means going out into the world, going afar off, sometimes to the uttermost parts of the world. But for others of us, 
It means Jerusalem, the area immediately around us. For others, it might be Judea. You know, I mean, um, I was going to say that would be Missoula, but that, I think that's more like Samaria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you understand that some of us are called to actually go out to far places, but all of us are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We're all given the job description of ambassador. Where does that start? Where do we start being ambassadors? Home. Yeah, starts with your family. Okay? That's there where the ministry of reconciliation begins. And then it, we carry out from there to the places where we are. So see, there's nowhere that you can go that you're not an ambassador. Okay, so whether you're at home, or whether you're at work, whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're at the shooting range, wherever you go, you are given charge of the ministry of reconciliation, the gospel, the good news. Okay, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Oh, wow. Are you guys starting to feel the responsibility that God has placed on us? Are you starting to feel the um, importance that God has placed on us? That he would make us his ambassadors? That he would entrust to us what he has done that we could take it out and share with others? We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now here's the crux of it, okay? We're coming back to redeem. Okay. For our sake, he, being God, made him, being Christ, to be sin. Who knew no sin? Okay. Do you understand what that means? That all sin that ever was, ever is, ever will be, has been laid on him. Okay? Do, do you understand how big that is? So you have to understand that because you have to understand why it is such an offense to God for people to not believe because God has paid the price for their sin through the shed blood of his son he made him sin and when people hear that and reject it and choose not to believe it they are telling God I don't want what you have done I don't want what you have given I choose to go my own way see that is the unforgivable sin. That is the unforgivable sin. There is no sacrifice that can cover that because the sacrifice for all sin has been made. But see, it doesn't end there. See, that's dealing with the problem. But then it comes on to something else. And this is something that I want to encourage you in because this is where I was stuck for a lot of years and sometimes still struggle. Okay? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. We have got to grasp this. Because see, one of the things that the enemy does, one of the lies that the enemy tells you that he has told me for years, is that God loved me enough to go to the cross for me, but that somehow or another, when I came to the point of salvation, I could do nothing to earn that salvation, but I had to do something to maintain it. Okay? Somehow or another, through my own ability, I had to maintain the perfection that was given me at the cross. Okay? And that way it leads to condemnation. Because you can't, ever do it. You can do nothing unto it. You can do nothing to maintain it. 
It is the free gift of God. Now, what, what we understand here, what this is telling us, is you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Can God sin? Can God's righteousness ever be blemished? No! Do you understand what that means? Listen, in Hebrews, it tells us, they're talking about how the priest had to come every year, and year after year after year, they had to offer the same sacrifice. Why? Because it was not sufficient. But Jesus, being the perfect sacrifice, once and for all, paid the price. Once and for all. Jesus does not need to go back to the cross. There is no sacrifice left for sin. It's done. It's accomplished. No more is needed. Okay? So, if that's the case, and I am the righteousness of God in Christ, Sin has no hold on me. None. Do you understand that? If you are the righteousness of God in Christ, sin has no hold on you. See, that's what it means to be redeemed. That you are taken out of sin. The price was paid when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. He didn't mean tune in next week. He meant it is done. The price is paid. The debt is paid in full. Nothing is owing. Nothing. So when we come to the cross, when we come to Christ, when we come to salvation, it is accomplished. Do we still sin? Yeah, we blow it. We blow it. We, we make mistakes. Sometimes willingly, sometimes stupidly, sometimes unknowingly. We still blow it. But it is covered. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Now, keep in mind, because there are some really wacky people out there that take that as an opportunity. Hey! Let's go sin. No. How can you be the righteousness of God in Christ and embrace sin? You can't. That doesn't work. Paul even goes so far as to say, absolutely not. There's no term that you can use in the Greek language that is more emphatic than the term Paul used. That's like, he's not going, yeah, that's not a good idea. He's going, no! Okay? Don't, don't do that. Don't use that as an opportunity to sin. Don't use that freedom as an opportunity to sin. So if I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and sin no longer has a hold on me, that makes all the more sense when Paul says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? Right? There is no condemnation. So, when you're struggling and you're starting to feel down about yourself and you're starting to go, oh, I blew it, oh. And, the, and that lie comes in and starts tearing you down, listen to me. The Spirit of God convicts of unrighteousness, right? Why does it convict of unrighteousness? To tear you down? No, to tear the sin away. Okay? So you know that there's something you're not supposed to be doing. But it's always to edify. It's always to build up so that we can continue to grow and mature in Christ. The Spirit comes in and convicts you. And yeah, you may feel remorse. I know I'm the only one that's ever done this, but God reveals a sin to me that I didn't realize was a sin. And I went, oh my gosh. I know none of you guys do that because you don't have unknown sin. Okay? But when God reveals that to me, there is remorse because I've offended God. There's another area in my life that I've realized, oh my gosh. But immediately on the heels of that comes what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. All right. Okay. Moving forward. 
Now condemnation, what does condemnation do? It keeps you trapped there. I'm never going to get over this. I'm never going to get beyond this. I'm stuck. That's from the enemy. That's a lie. Okay? That's deceit. Because that's not in his word. His word is we are the righteousness of God. So we're not stuck there. We are free to move forward. Amen? Amen. All right. Wow, this went quick. I have, I have homework for you. Okay? Off of what we talked about today, I want you to go back this week and I want you to spend time in Isaiah 53. Okay? Because looking at what we just talked about, what was accomplished, I want you to go back and look at what it cost God. His plan put in place, put into play, put into effect through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, So look up Isaiah 53. Spend some time there. Really grasp what Isaiah is prophesying straight from the heart of God. Okay, Spend some time there. Learn what redeemed is. So that when I ask who in here is redeemed? It's not this. That's right. Okay. Who in here is redeemed? All right. All right. All right. One more try. Who in here is redeemed? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Because see, if you're not excited about that, there is no way in the world you're going to be able to carry it outside these doors. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, we bless you today. God, I thank you for your redemption. Father, that when I was in the pit, and I was unworthy, God, you reached down from heaven, and you drew me out. Father, you pulled me from death and brought me into life. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Father, that have been brought from death to life. Father, that we've been purchased out of a life of slavery to sin. Father, your word says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I thank you for that freedom, God. I ask, Lord God, that for those here today, like me, that struggle, Father, with being the righteousness of God in Christ, that, Father, you would teach them as you're teaching me what that means. That, God, that in you there is no condemnation. That we are your workmanship, prized and dearly loved. I ask, Lord God, that you would illuminate this in our lives. Help us to be aware, Father. Help us to be sharp. Help us to be bold, to be faithful. And we bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name.